Hey podcast listeners, this is Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I recorded this episode with Nick Beckstead at the Effective Altruism Leaders Forum in San Francisco last month. Nick is one of the smartest people I know, so I was glad to get a couple of hours with him. If you want to learn how people who are heavily involved in the EA community think through problems, this is a great place to start. If you listened to my conversation with Toby Ord around a month ago, you can avoid some repetition by skipping the first 31 minutes because we cover pretty similar issues. As always, you can apply for free coaching if you want to work on any of the problems discussed in this episode. The blog post with this episode has a full transcript and links to many of the articles discussed in the show. You can subscribe by searching for 80,000 hours in your podcasting software. And now I bring you Nick Beckstead. Today, I'm speaking with Nick Beckstead. Nick is a program officer for the Open Philanthropy Project. Previously, he studied mathematics and philosophy, completed a PhD in philosophy at Rutgers University, and worked as a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. A lot of his research focuses on the importance of helping future generations and how we might best go about doing that. Nick, it should also be said, uh, happens to be my boss in a sense because he's a trustee of the Center for Effective Altruism, uh, which it's the umbrella organization that 80,000 Hours is a part of. So that's it. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast, Nick. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, so I'm hoping to have a pretty lengthy and wide-ranging discussion covering lots of topics that you're an expert on and some that we've spoken about over the last couple of years. But first, what kind of research are you doing at the Open Philanthropy Project now? Right now, my time is split mainly between two categories, one of which is supporting biology grant making at Open Phil. We have a couple of scientists that work with us on this and also Claire Zabel working on, us, working on it with us. And then the other major part of it is grant making to support the effective altruism community, including uh, the part of the effective altruism community that's particularly interested in existential risks. So those are, the, those are the two main things that I'm spending my time on. And then I'm sort of occasionally involved in other, other aspects of thinking about open fill strategy and thinking a little bit about philosophical frameworks for allocating funds across causes. What kind of philosophical questions? So I guess if you're starting sort of from first principles on that, you might ask questions like, um, all right, well, what ethical framework are you going to use to evaluate how good it would be if you accomplish goals associated with different causes? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, different frameworks, like especially with regards to questions about population ethics, would result in different valuations of accomplishing the different goals that correspond to open fills causes. Mm -hmm. Then there's questions about how you're handling um, moral uncertainty, because you, you sort of, you know, you could assign probabilities to all those different moral frameworks. There's a question of what you do given, you know, conclusions about what would be best according to each of these frameworks and what probabilities you assign to all the frameworks, how that is outputted into a decision about what to do. And there's sort of philosophical debates about, about that kind of thing. Okay. We'll come back to some of those questions in a minute. First, what, what kind of grants have you suggested to, to, to the Open Philanthropy Project? And uh, do you have any sense of how they've gone so far? I think we mostly don't know how the grants have gone so far because almost all the grants that, that I've recommended and have been made have, you know, it's, it's happened over the last year and a half. And, you know, a lot of these, a lot of what we're doing is, is funding, you know, scientific research or funding sort of growth of the effective altruist community. And many of those things sort of um, don't have uh, very obvious short term payoffs. So I think, it, I think, you know, we'll, we'll probably be able to say more about most of these things in, in a couple of years. Um, but right now, for the most part, I can't really sort of, I can't really tally up many of the grants in terms of like objective wins or losses. If we were going to add up, uh, you know, the grants made so far, the, the sort of biggest bets from the science program have been um, an investment in Target Malaria, which is an organization that's doing research aimed at developing gene drives for the el elimination of malaria, uh, provided that, you know, the strategy is agreed upon to be safe and ethical um, and, you know, approved by the communities that, that, that are affected and interested. Uh, an investment in Impossible Foods, which is an organization that's developing alternative alternatives to animal products, and uh, an investment in and, and a grant to Ed Boyden's lab at, at MIT. Those have been those have been some of the biggest sort of bets from the from the science program so far. Well, what does Ed Boyden work on? Uh, this 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 grant is supporting uh, work on expansion microscopy and um, some 
techniques basically for getting be- better uh, better imaging and you know measurement of the of the state of the brain. Um, it's a neuroscience grant. Right, right, right. So we'll work through a bunch of those different focus areas uh, later on. But uh, a large focus of the kind of grants that um, Open Philanthropy Project is making and that you're focused on in particular is trying to improve the, the long-term future of, of humanity as a whole. Uh, and you actually wrote your philosophy thesis on, uh, the, the, its title was The Overwhelming Importance of Shaping the Far Future, and it's available to read online. Uh, why should we worry so much about the long-term? The reason we should think so much about the long term, I guess if I was going to boil that down a lot, almost all of the, the almost all, if, you, if you're sort of adding up the well-being or the utility of all the beings that ever might live, um, then I think uh, if you sort of, if you sort of think about how likely is it that that civilization or a human influence civilization of some sort will be around for various periods of time, how large might it be? And thinking about how much utility there would be, sort of for each person at each at each part of time, and you kind of just are adding things up. That's sort of where almost all of the potential value is is in the distant distant future. Um, and it seems that there are some things that we can do now, particularly um, in terms of understanding and mitigating potential global catastrophic risks, uh, that have the potential to shape basically how large and good that future is. Um, so. I don't know if you, if you kind of just zoom out a little bit and think about us as a, as a species. We've been around for a couple hundred thousand years so far. We're we're on this planet that's going to be habitable for uh, several hundred million years, and we're in this uh, universe that's going to have stars burning for uh, you know billions or possibly trillions of years, depending on how many of the stars you're thinking about and exactly who you're asking. And it's uh, you know that. There's just there's just a, an overwhelming amount of, of of potential value at stake if you think about um, the possible ways that that could play out, which I think, on one hand, includes uh, you know our species not realizing its potential and maybe dying out too early if we sort of uh, don't do everything right, and you know I think also realistically on the opposite opposite end includes you know capturing al- almost all of the possible uh, value and building like the best possible future with that giant expanse of resources and space and time. Hmm. So what are the implications of this perspective? I guess uh, one that you've mentioned is that uh, we want to pr- reduce the risk of global catastrophic risks. So we, we, we don't want to die out because then, then we can't really do anything because uh, we're all dead. Uh, are there any other things that we should uh, be thinking about? Yeah, I think that's the most obvious implication. Um, I think uh, another possible implication, I think a, a framing I like, to, I like to put on this problem is to, is to say... So if you have this giant, if you have this giant amount of future resources that we have, and you know, so you say we've already avoided the global catastrophic risks, so we're going to reach a point where we go out and use all of them. Then the then the question is, you know, how exactly are they going to be used, and and what is going to determine that? And I think um, at, at that point, you're sort of hoping that you're hoping that like some wise choices are made at some point. Uh, along the way, um, where we're making decisions about about how how all of these things are used, that sort of you know still within reasonable ranges of planning and thinking about it. So, um, so I guess I would answer that. I guess the the, the question would be, you might refract factor it as like, how could you change our situation so that uh, better choices are made at critical junctures about important questions that might shape the long term future. Um, and I guess you could factor that into things that improve individual judgment and decision making, things that like improve collective judgment and decision making, things that are affecting kind of cult- share of cultural influence and, and values of those uh, who are sort of making these crucial choices. And um, I think it's a lot fuzzier when you start talking about exactly what you do about this. Um, but I think that things like um, sp- Enhancing the the growth and changing the character of like the effective altruist movement is good. I think things like uh, you know Phil Tetlock's work, trying to sort of build on that, popularize it, do like trials of of, of things like that, and have have those things be more incorporated into society is plausibly good. Um, I think that like just 
uh, having a having having things like uh, smarter people, better perhaps like better education system. I don't know. Th- there's there's a lot of possibilities. I'm a lot less opinionated on exactly what the best route forward is within that whole sphere of things, um, because I think a, a, a lot of it is is more debatable. Um, in terms of it, it's just it's it's kind of it's it's a lot more robust and straightforward to think about like what the case for well. If society is like, if there's a big global catastrophe, either we might be wiped out or it might really mess up how this how this sort of thing plays out. So presumably you didn't, uh, you know, give give that brief argument, and then the entire philosophy profession changed its mind and decided that uh, the shaping the far future is over, overwhelmingly important, and they would uh, just abandon all of their other research projects. Yeah. So uh, what kinds of subtleties uh, did you explore in in the thesis, and what kind of objections and responses are there? Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry to cast your mind back perhaps five years to your PhD defense, but uh, <laughs> see, see what you can. Yeah, do. so so one big kind of subtlety is uh, is to do with um, you know the value of of there being the difference in value between a future filled with sort of you know something really good, a lot of people with lives that are good and have have a lot of meaning in them, um, and uh, a world that's sort of more empty. So. Uh, I think there's there's a big set of philosophical questions about how exactly to what framework to use for assigning value to those different things in a you know subset of moral philosophy called population ethics, um, and you know the the sort of space of answers to that that is considered um, I think ranges from sort of maybe the the maybe the most the simplest view would just be, well, we add up all the utility. We just kind of take a utilitarian approach, and um, we list all the people that exist in the outcome. We say how well off their life, how, how well their life is going. We add it all up. Um, there's a sort of opposing view. It's kind of opposite, um, which is called a kind of person affecting view. And I say, I would say, the spirit of this view is to say, well, there's some set of people, like maybe the people that exist right now, or the people who are definitely going to exist regardless of what we do, um, or something like that. Um, we classify those people as like kind of the main people, and then we sort of count all those like other people that don't have to exist but might exist in the future, depending on what we do. We call them the extra people and say, let's just look at the let's just add up the the utilities of the main people. Or maybe let's add up the utilities of the main people and kind of place some very secondary weight on the utilities of the extra people. And then there's like kind of a family of views that you could call views of diminishing marginal value, where they would, they would say something like, "Well, it's good for there to be some extra people, um, but beyond a certain point, like just like they have less and less additional value per like extra person that you provide." So to get some sense of like how you would be applying these kinds of frameworks in some kind of real way, you could imagine like you could imagine like going back um, some point in the history of the world and say like. Imagine that. Imagine that, like um, some country had just kind of like sank into the ocean, uh, like a hundred years ago. Um, let's call it like country X. You could sort of count the lo- the harm done in like a number of ways. And I think like if you were kind of like an economist or something, maybe what you would do uh, if you were counting that up would be like uh, you might do something like count the number of people that died uh, when it sank into the ocean, and sort of assign like a value to each of their lives. And say, all right, that was like the harm done from this activity. Maybe you'd also count like some of the some of the harm done and like lost gains to the rest of the world by like not being able to trade from them or like profit from their innovations and things like that. Um, the sort of total view would do it a different way. It would sort of we in this in my example we know all the people who ever existed in you know because country X didn't sink into the ocean. We could like add up you know the value of all of their lives as well under the same framework. Um, and then, you know, that you could have some kind of intermediate approach, depending on your view about, like, the diminishing value if you wanted to take some be- in-between answer. So um, that's one of the big main philosophical considerations is, like, basically which of these views you adopt. In my dissertation, I did something, like, a bit fancier than this and said, well, um, maybe, maybe uh, it doesn't exactly... You know, maybe you don't have to exactly have something like the total view. Maybe there's some other views that kind of operate uh, sort of equivalently to that um, at the range of kind of adding up value in different periods of history. But I think maybe we don't need to get into like that particular like, subtlety uh, unless you want to um, for purposes of this discussion. So I guess 
that that would be the first category of uh, of ways people would disagree with me would be that maybe they would adopt uh, a person affecting view mm-hmm. um, and say you know let's let's not if if the world is destroyed let's count the harm by adding up the deaths of all the people who are, who who die when the world is destroyed let's not count up let's not count up the harm in terms of like the massive foregone astronomical future benefits mm. um so that'd be one kind of category of disagreement mm. briefly another category of disagreement would be like time discounting um so uh some people would argue that um benefits that are occur- occurring more distantly in the future um are are intrinsically less valuable, um, and we should you know have some kind of exponential discount rate. And if you do that, then unless you have sort of you know benefits per unit time growing at like some faster than exponential rate, which is sort of physically implausible, then like well, all, in the very long term, in the very long term, uh, uh, then you know almost all of the value of the future is going to be something that you could sort of like capture in the next uh, say you know several hundred, several thousand years. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that would be the other the other way somebody could. Those, those are probably the most two most common ways someone could disagree with me. Maybe a third most common way would be like sort of more of an empirical disagreement. That's like that's like well, this is all well and nice, but it's like so difficult to like predict anything about the future that like we should just do the same things we always thought we should have done before we ever thought about this set of arguments. Mm. My understanding is that the the time discounting approach is uh, not really accepted by almost any moral philosophers or really anyone who's thought about this kind of question from an ethical uh, point of view. Uh, Is that right? It's it's pretty unpopular. Yeah, it's pretty much not accepted by moral philosophers. Um, It is accepted by economists sometimes (laughs) who have thought about it. Um, And I'm, I'm not clear how much, like, how much this is like seen as like a question that like people really dig into and debate about mm. in economics, but it usually is when I'm getting this argument, it's usually somebody who's like sort of influenced by the economics profession in some way, and like I never really got this argument from philosophers. Mm. I suspect that economists who are putting this forward are misunderstanding or perhaps answering a different question than than the one that you are. Uh, they're perhaps like discounting the value of capital rather than the value of you know di- direct. Uh, like morally valuable experiences or something like that. Yes, yes, I agree with that, and it's and it's kind of confusing because there there is importance in in, in using using discount rates for that kind of thing. I, I view them as a sort of something that's intended to be and functions efficiently as a sort of like heuristic approximation for doing a kind of normal utilitarian calculation, um, especially when you're kind of allocating between like you know two goods of a relatively similar type over a period of like decades assuming like nothing really crazy happens with the world i think like the sort of standard economic approach to discounting has like good rationales in terms of you know thinking about other uses of like a delayed investment or like accumulation uh, of value from some asset, just like growing in the world or being reinvested in a company or organization or country or something like that. But I think it, it goes a little bit crazy um, if it starts telling you that, you know, uh, a billion years of utopia that happens like a billion years from now is like worth a, like less than a penny or something. Mm. So let's take that one off the table. I, I, I agree, that doesn't strike me as that plausible uh, intuitively. So, so let's take that one off the table. But the other one, the other two are a little bit uh, trickier. There is disagreement in philosophy about uh, whether we should embrace the person-affecting view or not. To be honest, I've never really heard a, a coherent explanation of the person-affecting view and how exactly you would define uh, who is included as the kind of the baseline people and, and who are the extra people. But, but perhaps that's, that's my fault rather than uh, philosophy's fault. Uh, why don't you personally uh, place that much credence on the person-affecting view, if, if indeed you don't? Let's see. So I'm, I'm kind of going through the mental motion of going back to my dissertation mm-hmm. and thinking about the chapter of, of the, where I discuss person-affecting views. Um, so I think the, like, so a, a sloganized intuition behind uh, the person-affecting view is, like, we're in favor of making people happy, not making happy people. Um, and I think someone, someone could arrive at this by, you know, I think there's, there's a number of different types of, uh, uh, of intuitions that, that feed into this. So, um, you know, one kind of intuition is, like, who is the beneficiary of this action? Um, You know, suppose we consider the world where we don't have, like, a big utopia in the distant future. 
Um, and we compare that with a world where we do have uh, a utopia in the distant future. Um, you know, and suppose, you know, we, so we don't, we don't have this utopia and we kind of, we could, you can kind of imagine an exercise where we say like, raise your hand if this negatively affected you. And, you know, sort of no one raises their hand because, uh, anyone who could have raised their hand doesn't exist. They only exist in this other possible world. And, um, so there's kind of like, who's the beneficiary of this? Nobody really. So, you know, what's, what's wrong with, What's uh, what's so bad about us not having this this big utopia? What's the problem now? What's the problem now? Um, and you know, so I guess what's what's the answer to that question? I guess I, I would ask, I, I would try to try to poke that intuition by kind of offering um, uh, offering like a parallel type of problem for someone to think about. Um, so you know, uh, if we imagine a world in which. Uh, Kind of the inverse of this. So imagine that instead of considering like some great utopia that could have been created, suppose there was like some great hell that we averted. You know, would have had some large number of people having terrible lives, uh, and we managed to avert it. And we say, great, who's the beneficiary of this? Um, and we, no one can raise their hand. Um, similarly, um, so there's, there's a structurally similar argument. Yet I think like few people would find it like a terribly compelling thought to say, like, well, since no one raised their hand, there's really no utility in having averted that hell. So, like, let's 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 assign it zero value, um, that accomplishment. And so I think that I think that this I think that like this kind of sort of the rhetoric associated with this has sort of failed to capture the intuition behind the like I'm in favor of making uh, people happy, not making happy people. Um, Another thing, I, another thing that's going that's interesting about this is it sort of like reveals an asymmetry in in the intuitions people have. So if we if we're considering cases where, uh, and now now we're talking less at the level of like you know I've got a philosophical rationale for this and more at a sort of just reflecting on thoughts about cases. Um, I think many people would think of a case where you're considering creating an extra life um, and saying okay you know. Would it have been good to create this extra life? A lot of people kind of have an intuition that's like, mm, I, I'm okay with it if we don't create another happy person, um, and you know it's just kind of not that big of a deal. Um, whereas you know I think everyone pretty much agrees that like if you're kind of like causing some person to exist who has a horrible life, that's bad. Um, there's some kind of asymmetry there, um, and you know I think. One of the one of the puzzles in this in this in this literature and philosophy is kind of trying to explain that asymmetry. Um, so I think I might be rambling a little bit. What uh, <laughs> what was the original question well, here? I guess, I guess it was all very relevant. Uh, but my question was why why don't you personally accept the person affecting view? Were you convinced through these kind of philosophical thought experiments, or is it is it more of an intuitive judgment that you just didn't see the appeal of the person affecting view? Yeah. Um, so. The methodology that I like to use for this, I guess, is you could sort of you could sort of ask yourself: Is there is there um, maybe three 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 kinds of questions? Like one, just like do the implications of this view seem intuitive and natural? Like two, is there a good is there a good kind of like philosophical rationale for why we should only be attending to the interests of like sort of like the main people and not like extra people that we could create, um, and particularly only the extra people whose lives are good and not the extra people whose lives are bad, and like three, um, you know, when we sort of run run the different available views on this question against like a gamut of philosophical thought experiments and sort of tally up the damage taken by every view. Um, like, and also try to sort of think about which of these, you know, views might be caused by some kind of bias in the way we're processing, processing the case. For example, you can ask partiality for ourselves or partiality for people who we know and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, then we could ask, like, which of these views is sort of taking the most damage? And I guess I would say, um, you know, we could go through more. I started going through, like, one of them. I haven't found any of the, like, sort of philosophical rationales for this view very compelling. Um, and I think like this view, uh, it has like a couple of cases that I think of as like sort of the most compelling arguments for it, but it has other costs that I see like in terms of, you know, counter intuitive counter examples that are larger, um, than, than the other, than, than the other views, like the total view on this, on this point. 
And I so guess, I, guess I guess I just I don't think it's winning on any of those fronts. I is see. so I don't know. We could try and drill down on those. Yeah. Um, but that's like the high level answer. Sure. I, I guess let's maybe not uh, draw down on those uh, right now because uh, we could just link to the chapter in your in your thesis. Sure. Um, but I imagine one of them is the um, famous non-identity problem that that uh, Derek Parfit identified in Reasons and Persons. Yeah, that would be that would be you know a good one that sort of illustrates. I think it's I think one thing that that illustrates is uh, there's something kind of natural about this thought. Like yeah, you know. Um, better to better to help people that exist than cause there to be extra happy people. I think what the non-identity problem illustrates is basically that, like, it's very difficult to formally specify something uh, that you know satisfies this cry that 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 sort of preserves this intuition and also says plausible things about all the cases that people can imagine. Um, and uh, so that that that's a bit of a puzzle for a person affecting the use. Sure. I mean, another... I should say, like, um, there's maybe a bit of an underrated paper by Chris Meacham that's like an attempt to to solve this problem that maybe you could link to, um, and uh, you know, uh, and I, I think I, I I've thought less about that one and have certain objections to it, but I don't really discuss it in my dissertation. Sure. Uh, another challenge for me in accepting the person affecting view would be that. Uh, I don't think the idea that I am the same person as I was when I was a child or that I will be when I'm a lot older uh, really makes uh, that much sense. Uh, and that's another uh, idea that uh, Derek Parfit ex explores in Reasons and Persons. Yeah. And just like, uh, like my, my properties will be different and it's not clear why the continuity uh, between who I am today and uh, who I am in 20 years' time really means yeah. that I'm the same person in, in a morally relevant sense. One of the arguments that's in the dissertation that's a little bit like, I mean, a lot of them already appear in the philosophical literature, and it's kind of more like a review and summing up and taking damage counts for all the views. But one, one kind of argument I hammer on a bit more is that if you really accepted this person affecting view, um, it would it seems like it has kind of implausible implications for thinking about like the value of sort of preventing the destruction of the world, um, which is really the kind of main question that I'm like I want a framework to give plausible answers to for for the purposes of this discussion. Um, so if you said like all right, how good would it be if we like prevented the destruction of the world? Like let's let's consider all the future beings um, and forget about like all the current beings for a moment. Like um, you know on the strict person affecting view, which taking it as like in this asymmetric way, um, it seems like your argument, it seems like what you would end up saying is, well, if we, if we cause there to be all these future beings and there's a utopia, then that's going to have basically zero value because all those beings are extra, so we're not going to add them up in our grand utility calculus. Um, but like, there'd be some probability that like uh, things turn out badly for the future beings, or that some probability that it turn out badly for a fraction of the future beings. Um, in which case, it seems like you'd be ending up with an argument that, like, well, it would be negative if that happened. So then, if you consider this as like a gamble, and you say like, well, this could be good, uh, this couldn't be good, but it could be bad. Then it's sort of like automatically bad to save the world, um, at least counting all these future benefits leaving aside the benefits to the current people. And that just seems like it can't be the like right framework for thinking about this problem. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about discounting, and we've talked about the person affecting view. Uh, the yeah. third objection is that uh, even if it would be good to make the future go better, uh, you can't really do that. Or maybe you can, but only by making the present better. Uh, what, what do you think about that, just briefly? Yeah. Um, so I guess my first objection to this would be like, you know, there are like a number of possible like global catastrophic risks that seem like they could affect whether and how the long term future plays out. Um, so the persons making this argument would essentially be saying that like there's nothing that we can do about any of those global catastrophic risks, um, or the extent to which we can affect them is like so small that it's like really really not worth considering. Um, so I think. So, you know, that this person is essentially saying, like, well, there's nothing really we can really do um, to reduce the risk of nuclear war. Um, there's nothing we can really do to uh, reduce the risk of, like, an asteroid hitting the Earth. There's nothing we can really do uh, about potential risks from advanced AI. There's nothing we can do in pandemic preparedness yeah. that would, like, re re reduce the probability of, like, a doomsday pandemic happening. It's not even possible that you could think of other problems that we haven't yet listed where you could make an impact. And, you know, I think, like, in any of these cases, you might say it's a very small probability, but, um, you know, I think, I just, I think this is, like, this, I, 
I think this doesn't seem like a particularly plausible suggestion that there that there's nothing you can do about any of these things. It might feel more like as an individual that there's nothing you can do about any of these things. Um, I think one reframing of of it that I could offer would be like, well, do you think like many individuals doing something about it could collectively make some kind of difference on it. So, you know, it depends on like what kind of unit you want to think of yourself as. But say if you thought of like the effective altruist community as like a group of like, you know, thousands of people who are like trying to do something about one of these problems. It seems like not at all absurd to believe that like, you know, if you had like thousands of people trying to work on like pandemic preparedness that like they could improve pandemic preparedness and sort of make it more likely that if there was like sort of a doomsday biocatastrophe, you know, we'd be more prepared for that in some way. We'd be more likely to detect it early and stop it. We would be more likely to uh, be able to like develop a vaccine quickly and deploy it more quickly. Um, so, so I, I, I have I have limited sympathy with the view. Um, I think my interlocutor might say something like, you know, these probabilities are are are, are super made up, and you know, it's it's not really going to translate into anything. But uh, I don't know. If you if you want to represent the other side, give it a go. <laughs> well, obviously, I don't agree with this view. Given I'm like <laughs> spending my career trying to uh, get more people to spend their career reducing global catastrophic risks. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I just think it's uh, it's implausible that having thousands of smart people working on you know difficult scientific or political problems just doesn't in like just in principle cannot improve those problems because we just see throughout history that thousands of smart people working on difficult problems just very frequently are successful. They invent new things or they run campaigns to change policy. Uh, the idea that you'd be so pessimistic that there's just virtually zero chance that a community of smart people trying to reduce global catastrophic risks, uh, that they couldn't have any impact is... Uh, yeah. it, it, I just don't understand what the basis for it is. It seems like an extremely strong claim. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What other kinds of objections might you have to this? Like, Another kind of objection you might have would be like, well, what we really want to do, um, what you would really want to do if you wanted to like make sure the long term future turns out really well would be try to make sure that like powerful countries have like well functioning institutions. Um, so maybe like our democratic discourse is sort of more civil and reasonable um, or maybe we have like better people in office or, you know, and you, you somebody I could imagine somebody arguing like this is the most important thing to be doing regardless of what you believe about this set of considerations and therefore this whole discussion is kind of irrelevant when um, deciding like what it is best to do mm -hmm. um, and I think like I think I think like this is a plausible view um, and I kind of just just sort of it would come down to like differences of it would come down to differences of degree about like how big are these global catastrophic risks? How much could we reduce them? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, how likely is it that that like sort of will end up with a good future under kind of business as usual with no global catastrophes? And I think mm -hmm. that 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 seems like something you could have more of a kind of Some reasonable of question. Yeah, like you could have more of a debate about. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. more of a taste based question. Yeah, I'd flag that issue to to discuss later on. So okay. maybe, maybe we'll come back with that if we have time. Okay. Let's move on from your thesis to talking about some uh, concrete details about the specific global catastrophic risks that we face. As you said, uh, the main re thing that convinces you that we actually can do something about these is just looking at the details and seeing that there's useful work that, that can be done that seems like it would make a difference. Mm -hmm. Which global catastrophic risks do you think it's most valuable to have extra people working on it or extra money going towards uh, reducing them? Yeah. Well, my basic framework for thinking about this question would be kind of go through the go through the list of global catastrophic risks and say, you know, what's the expected harm of this risk? Which ones are most likely to, uh, you know, derail civilization? If I was sort of assigning subjective probabilities to them based on what I know about them, um, which of these risks are getting the most attention? Um, in terms of sort of dollars and like number of like very talented people that are working on them, and which of these risks um, just does it just, does it seem like there's the most to do about them? Um, and they they you know so Open Phil has has a blog post um, it's probably a few years old now that kind of goes through and ranks all of the global catastrophic risks in a in a in a spreadsheet, and um, I think I still mostly agree with. With uh, with that blog post, um, so the output of that is that uh, the the risks that Open Phil is prioritizing are um, 
you know, potential risks from advanced artificial intelligence and uh, biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. Um, so those two risks are, you know, are in my opinion scoring, you know, some of the highest in terms of likelihood of derailing civilization. Um, and uh, they're also they're also, you know, get very limited attention um, from the philanthropic community. So I think Open Phil is the the, the largest. Um, philanthropic foundation that's funding work on either of those and um you know so there's there's they, they score pretty well in terms of how neglected they are and then um and then i think each of them you know they're they're not as sort of it's not as easy to tell you know whether your work's going to turn out to be very useful on them um and how well you're doing as it is with you know some other things like uh say, malaria eradication or something like that. Or, or even um, asteroid detection. Or even asteroid detection. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it does seem like there's things that, you know, given some plausible assumptions about the world, like, you know, there being some chance of developing transformative AI in the next couple of decades, um, or, uh, you know, there being some reasonable prospect of, uh, you know, it being possible to engineer really devastating pandemics in in the next couple of decades where, uh, you know, preparation of various sorts seems like it could get you somewhere with these. Uh, what other problems do you think are uh, most pressing to work on besides those two, just, just from any, any uh, cause area? What else is most pressing to work on uh, apart from these? I would say it depends on who you're you're asking this this question to in a way. So you know, I, I would answer this question differently if you know um, I were like advising the United States government on like what its priorities were versus like if I were kind of like advising a young person who was like trying to decide what to do with their career and had like EA inclinations. Um, so uh, you know, for the latter category, I might say I. I might say, like, well, maybe you should, apart from working in these areas, maybe um, working in, like, the effective altruist community could be quite good, um, and maybe working on, like, sort of better political judgment and decision-making um, could be quite good. You know, it, if I were sort of, like, advising the, the, the U.S. government, I'd have a, a sort of different set of answers, and I mostly think about the, the latter question, because hmm. that's who's asking me. Right. <laughs> Uh, so the Open Philanthropy Project has a whole bunch of money that it's trying to give away. Uh, on what problems do you most struggle to find people who can usefully do work with that? And what, and what kind of problems? One category where I would say we're um, really struggling to find people to do valuable work um, and would like to have more people doing valuable work uh, is the sort of strategic aspect of potential risks from advanced AI. So, um, you know, the way the way I would think about um, about about what the what risk we're interested in and preparing for in in artificial intelligence, I would say I would say there's 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 basically two categories. Um, one of them is kind of the AI alignment problem or loss of control. So there's a scenario where you have a very powerful uh, artificial intelligence system or set of systems that uh, where people kind of, there's a misalignment between the intentions of uh, the people who've designed the system and, um, and like, some goal that the system itself is pursuing. And, you know, I think, I think you know, people like Nick Bostrom have explained um, why, they're, why that's a potential risk and why the harm could be quite large in certain types of cases, not today, but, you know, further down the line. Um, and then the other kind of category is uh, is just you know maybe you maintain control of the system it's following the user's intentions but maybe the user's intentions are are not that good or aren't very aligned with what's best for the world um, and you there there could be some plausible scenarios in which like uh, some group having an advantage in in artificial intelligence could result in a in a concentration of power and uh, and harm coming from that. Um, and then there's a bit of an interaction between between the two of these things. Um, you can imagine scenarios where uh, you know where it takes some maybe it's kind of difficult to to solve this to solve this alignment problem, and at the same time um, 
at the same time, it's it's you know different people are worried about what other people will do if they have this if they if they are the ones who get a concentration of power, and uh, it seems like there, there's a there's a recipe for harm there. Um, so in terms of solving this problem, the effective altruist community has like really focused most of its discussion so far on uh, the the technical aspect of this, which is you know what are the principles um, that could be used to uh, or the technical specifications that could be used to design a system that, you know, uh, alignment is retained between what the system is doing and um, the intentions of its creators. Um, and less attention has gone to something that's more of a political or strategic problem, which is uh, how, you know, what is the proposed way of proceeding, given that you have created um, some very powerful artificial intelligence systems that everyone could agree to, um, that you know would likely solve both of, solve both of these problems and be accept acceptable to um, the main parties that need to be influenced, whether they're uh, companies or states, um, and uh, you know th thinking through that problem. Um, is something that uh, you know I would I would love to see uh, more people in the effective altruist community thinking through. Um, so that's 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 an example of something. Um, maybe that was more detailed than you're going for for that, but no, that, that's one category. Uh, um, another category, I still think the technical side of this AI problem uh, deserves a lot more attention than it gets. Um, I would love to see people uh, contributing to biosecurity and pandemic preparedness um, in in a couple of different ways. Um, on one hand, there are there are a lot of sort of technical problems that could be solved, and you know, uh, somebody who is a really good biologist um, really thinks a lot about this problem um, could could make a big difference in terms of getting us in a better position to uh, rapidly deploy medical countermeasures, such as um, immunizing the population more quickly than is currently possible. Um, or uh, you know, getting getting a wider variety of broad spectrum uh, antivirals uh, that could be used and deployed in the case of a of a pandemic, getting us uh, you know uh, just tools that will make surveillance and diagnosis uh, cheaper, more ubiquitous, more rapid. Um, so there's a, there's a suite of technical issues there, um, and uh, on the flip side of that, um, you know. Uh, I think, and this is this is sort of less my my area to think through, but uh, I, I have less to say about it than the sort of the sciencey side of it. But um, it seems like uh, you know there's a lot that could be done on the policy side in terms of getting governments to pay more attention to this and understand the the biggest threats that they should be preparing for, improving surveillance systems, um, and you know making sure that like the most crucial research is is, is well funded. Um, I think you know. And, and the, the career route there would be people learning about um, biosecurity policy, getting into the field. I think it'd be a great area that a lot of effective altruists uh, could contribute to, hmm. but doesn't really get that much attention from our community at this point. I spoke with Howie Lempel, who used to work at the Open Philanthropy Project for about two and a half hours about this. So okay. if you'd like to hear more on the biosecurity, uh, then you can, uh, we'll, we'll stick up a link to Yeah, to, it's probably better to, to hear his version of that yeah. answer. <laughs> Uh, you've also been heavily involved in the effective altruism community f over the last five years, basically since its inception. Uh, so you're, you're familiar, I guess, with both its pros and its cons. Uh, how would you like to see the EA community improve and do better? I think uh, I think I would like to see more people um, being dedicated to some of these problems and some of the other problems uh, in a full-time way, in a high-attention way um, with their careers, not just um, with their donations and not just kind of uh, as a side project that they sort of may discuss on the internet and things like that, but um, I think you know really really getting a little bit more uh, full time and and fully focused and specialized on particular aspects of this and thinking about where they can tr can contribute. Um, I think you know like one of my hobbies, the thing that I find really interesting to do is like read about um, big accomplishments of humanity in the past and like read biographies of people who achieve great things and. I think one of the things that's come out of that for me and just like thinking about, um, you know, how people have a lot of impact in the world, I think it's really hard to sort of like have a home run like as a sort of like spare time venture and, or as, a, as like a personal side project. And so I think um, I think I would love to see more people, you know, trying to ask themselves like, 
what piece of this could I go full time on? What piece of this could I become an expert on? And um, I think, you know, finding jobs in in these problems, in the effective altruism community, uh, finding jobs in the government that advising people on like how we should deal with all of these things um, would be a big improvement from, uh, you know, the extent to which people are currently emphasizing things like earning to give. Um, so I think that would probably be my like sort of top ask for, for the EA community. Hmm. Uh, a question that often comes up is whether effective altruism should aim to be a very broad movement that appeals to potentially hundreds of millions of people and, you know, helps them each to make uh, a somewhat larger contribution or whether it should be more, say, like uh, an academic research group or an academic research community that has only perhaps thousands or tens of thousands of people involved, uh, but then tries to get a lot of value out of each one of them, really get them to make you know, intellectual advances that are, that are very valuable for the world. Uh, what's, your, what's your thought on that, on, on the two options there? I guess if I have to pick one, maybe I would pick like, Maybe I would pick the second option, but I might frame it a little bit differently and I might say, you know, let's leave the first option open in the long run as well. I guess the way I see it right now is this movement, th th this community doesn't have currently a, a like scalable use of a lot of people. Um, so there are, some, there are some groups that have found like efficient scalable uses of a lot of people and they're using them in kind of different ways. So for example, like if you look at something like Teach for America, they, you know, they they ha they 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 sort of identified an area where man, we could really use tons and tons of ta of of talented people. We'll train them up in a specific in a specific problem, improving the US education system, a and and then like and then, you know, we'll get tons of them to do that and Various of them will keep working on that, and some of them will understand uh, the problems that the U.S. Educa education system faces, and you know, fix some of its policy aspects. That's a very much a scalable use of people. There's kind of a very clear instruction and like a way that there's like kind of an obvious role for everyone. I think the effective altruist community doesn't have like a scalable use of kind of like a lot of its highest value. Uh, of, 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 it, there's not really a scalable way to accomplish a lot of its like highest valued objectives that's sort of kind of standardized like that. Um, so like the, the closest thing we have to that right now is um, well you can earn to give and you can um, you can like donate to any of the like causes that are sort of most favored by the effective altruist community. Um, so I would feel like the sort of mass movement version of it would be more compelling if we had in mind like a really efficient and valuable, scalable use of, of, of people, um, which I think is something we've like figured out less. So I guess what I would say is, right now, I think we should figure out how to like productively use all of the people who are you know interested in in doing as much good as they can, um, and uh, you know focus on filling a lot of the kind of higher value roles that we we can think of that you know aren't always like so standardized or something. Like we don't need like you know, we don't need like 2000 people to be, uh, to be like working on AI strategy or to like be working on, uh, you know, technical AI safety. Exactly. Um, so, so I, I, I would focus more on, uh, on, um, on like figuring out how to, how we can best use the, the people that we have right now. Um, another modification, I guess, to just picking the sort of like small group instead of the broad mass movement thingy. Um, I don't think it's all about research. I think a lot of this is like about implementation and like management and operations and like running an organization really well. And uh, so it's not it's not just like four eggheads or something that are going to like write like weird research papers about like the value of future lives or something like that. I think there's I think there's like a, a lot of a lot of ways um, for people to contribute. And I think that the relevant access for access for me is more like how. Are, are you like full time dedicated and thinking about the problem in a sophisticated way, um, less than like is it sort of like you know academic or researchy or something like that? Uh, in my experience, you have uh, one of the like best overall judgments of anyone I've met, uh, which is uh, kind of one of the roles that you need in a community. You need some people to be coming up with the new crazy ideas, being contrarian, you know, getting people to think new thoughts. Then you also need you know honest brokers who just consider all of the arguments on one side and all of the arguments on the other and uh, try to reach uh, a balanced judgment uh, that other people can trust. Uh, how do you think you've cultivated that over of your life? Were you kind of born this way, or is it a result of philosophy training or something else? 
It's a difficult question. Let me think about that for a second. <laughs> I think that I'm sort of unusually high on on skepticism and uh, and unusually sort of place an unusually high amount of value on authenticity in what I'm saying. So if I if I if I'm saying something that I don't quite know or like it's a little bit off somehow and I notice it, I'm kind of like running it through my head all the time and saying like is that exactly true or is it more like this other thing? That might be a piece of it. I I I have a lot of skepticism and I think uh just uh, just about um about like kind of established fields and ways of doing things that people say, you know, this is a trustworthy way of of thinking or like this research methodology works. I think I don't. I don't necessarily have like default trust in in kind of the conventional wisdom uh, uh, of that sort until I've kind of spent some time poking it, or unless there's kind of obvious use of the of the reasoning method in the world. So you know, if people are building rocket ships with some physics, then you know, I I kind of uh, I'm likely to really give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, that th those are some initial thoughts. I don't feel like I know the answer to this question. I think I more just attempted to generate an answer and didn't didn't, didn't really quite succeed at it. Do you feel like your judgment has gotten better better over time? Definitely, it has. Maybe some some tools that I feel like I've gotten some juice out of learning philosophy and learning how to like take something that's written and be like, all right, what were the main claims in this thing? What were the arguments for it? Did the arguments have like uh, a struct the structure of a valid argument? Which of these premises was the weakest? I think I got a fair amount of juice out of out of learning that type of stuff. Uh, I think. I got a fair amount of juice out of uh, out of just like thinking a lot about Bayesian epistemology, um, you know, being like, all right, I'm gonna assign, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the kind of person that assigns credences to things and tries to act in accordance with my credences and bet in accordance with them, and be willing to do that. Maybe there's something about that 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 is particularly useful. I think just like I think the effective altruist community, like there there are people in this community that I've learned a lot from. Um, interacting with and maybe there, there there's there's a piece of that there it's a good answer <laughs> i think for quite a few years now i've just been in the habit of giving probabilities to to almost everything uh that, that, that comes up or whenever you're thinking about a contentious issue you just kind of attach a credence to it yeah uh, and it's it's kind of hard for me to remember how i thought before that uh, how would you even deal with these issues um yeah so i think that's one if you're able to pick that pick that up and just make that a habit that's uh, something that i'd definitely recommend and I think if you get involved in the effective altruism community, it might be hard to avoid uh, picking that one up. I'd say it's somewhat contagious. Maybe just being in the mood of like thinking like there are a bunch of ways that people rationalize and self-deceive, and trying to know about them and trying to notice it if 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 I if if I'm doing it myself or if like I'm saying something that's not quite right because like I have a side in an argument and maybe I should sort of take a step back and notice that I'm doing that like conceding ground inch by inch rather than saying like oh the evidence is going in one way here um, maybe I should just sort of follow that where it leads yeah on your personal website you have a list of books that uh, influenced your thinking uh, that you particularly recommend other people read and I've gradually been working through them over the last few years uh, what are a few of those that you would like to mention here so my website is audiobooks. It's just books that I've been listening to over the last few years. You know, they're all they're all different and interesting in different ways. And probably if you if you if I had just restricted it to like books full stop, uh, I might have a different list of books and perhaps an idi more idi less idiosyncratic one in some ways and more idiosyncratic in some other ways. But I'll just restrict the answer to the audiobooks that I've been listening to over the last few years. So one of them that I really liked uh, is Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker. When I first saw this book, I thought I wouldn't find it that exciting because the subtitle of it was like, I can't remember, is it why violence has declined or how violence has declined? And I was like, well, you know, I kind of believe by default that like things have been getting better and like violence has been declining. I don't find that hard to believe. What am I really going to get out of this book? But I actually thought it had a really interesting blend of, of thinking it, it, so it did a number of things that I like. So one, it took this sort of macro historical perspective, like where is the world going? Two, it had like a nice blend of uh, empirical, uh, of quantitative and qualitative data. Three, it had sort of plausible and interesting speculation about like the mechanisms of why that was happening. So, you know, it's filled with these graphs that, you know, illustrate a, a, a lot of the main point, but also it has these really interesting qualitative stories about 
well, you know, we used to t- torture people in this ways or in these ways, or people used to get in fights on the beach over like women, and it was like a macho and cool thing to do. Various things that you kind of just know about but don't exactly think about all the time, and it sort of weaves a, a nice and plausible story um, about how that all fits together. So I thought that was a really enjoyable book. Pinker has a, a new book coming out, I think, in December or January called Enlightenment Now. Uh, I think I'm going to enjoy a lot. Perhaps it'll be more of a cheerleading book than anything else, but uh, I'm, I'm excited for that one. I'll list another one and talk about it a little bit um, here. And I've got a, a bunch of other ones, um, but uh, The Power Broker by uh, Robert Caro is a really interesting book. Um, and it's all about this figure, uh, Robert Moses, who came to power basically as like became this very overpowered civil servant in the history of New York. It tells the story of how he did this and how he eventually got some very large budget that he was working with. I can't, it was like some <laughs> sizable fraction of like all of New York City's money that was like mainly under like the control of his authority that he was was in charge of. This is an, an, an immense book. I think it's a 60 hour long audiobook and I'm 40 hours through. And right. uh, it has this extraordinary story at one point about how he managed to, he was running, I think, the Triborough Bridge Authority and various other statutory authorities that the city government had created. And he put he took a bunch of loans from, uh, from bankers who wanted to lend money to construct infrastructure. And he put into the bonds agreements that he would be leading this, uh, the, the Triborough Bridge Authority and did all of these other uh, infrastructure authorities. And it then became legally impossible to remove him because it would be a violation of the uh, of borrowing from the bank. Right. Uh, and of course, the politicians hadn't noticed that he could do this, nor did they know that he had done it. Right. But as a result, he was able to stay in this role by just rolling over these bonds that always had an, an agreement that he would could never be fired. Uh, he was able to remain in control for right. decades. So it's, I think that's a really valuable and interesting book because, you know, I, I really enjoy um, certain types of biographies as like micro histories. You kind of learn all these things about how a political system works in one place or how an organization works in one place. If you, you can kind of build up an inventory of these things over time that you know about. And then when people make kind of interesting general claims about how things work, I like to test them against like the sort of micro histories that I know about and be like, ah, does that really fit like with the, the life of Robert Moses or does that fit with what I learned about the life of um, Steve Jobs or like does that really fit with what I learned uh, from, you know, XYZ compendium of like high, of people who influence the world a lot and their like mini biographies and um, I think that can be very valuable an interesting piece of the world that uh, you know I wouldn't otherwise know a lot about but it seems like it kind of can be used to like test a lot of these other general claims that I about how things work and you can kind of think about it as as you're reading through. Do you want to give a give a third one? Yeah. Um, one that's been more divisive uh, among uh, my friends has been uh, Moral Mazes by uh, Robert Jackal. Do you want to yeah. quickly describe that? I got this recommendation from like Aaron Swartz's list of books that he liked. And I would kind of call this like basically like someone doing an ethnography of a couple of different corporations and describing how things, uh, what kinds of failure modes there there were in these organizations and where incentives would and wouldn't be compatible. I really enjoyed I really enjoyed the book for that purpose. Let's see. I, I'm trying to remember anecdotes from it. I think maybe one kind of anecdote that's fairly illustrative that I that I that I would find interesting would be there would be people in these kind of be responsible for like manufacturing plants and they'd be in these positions a period of a few years and um, they would they would be judged on like how well things were going while they were there at the power plant or sorry at the plant. You know, they would have this expression called like milking the plant, which would be like a thing you could do where basically you would kind of cut corners on like maintenance of everything and uh, trade off sort of short term gains for long term gains. And it wouldn't really show up in the metrics that anyone was using to evaluate how well the managers of these plants were doing. And then by the time there was a problem, like several years later, the manager would have been like promoted or moved on to another role in the company. Um, And this was kind of like basically known uh, to be a thing by a number of the people that he interviewed. Um, So I thought that was like a very interesting thing. Um, Another thing I found very interesting, like perhaps this is like naive and like not that interesting to most people, but interesting to me as someone who hasn't like worked in a giant bureaucracy. You know, people tended to talk about their work like I work for this person. Um, like, and less like I work for this company and, you know, it kind of be like, there would be this kind of very transactional, uh, relationships where, um, you know, you, the person you work for, you're kind of 
you know, making sure that they look good and gathering information for them and feeding it to them. And the person you work for is kind of like making a bet on you as an apprentice. And like, you know, if they rise within this bureaucracy, then they'll bring you on as like a, an appointment um, to like hire on roles. And I just think uh, it sort of highlighted a lot of dysfunction that I don't know where else I would like know about unless I uh, unless I sort of had like lived through it or something. So I found it really interesting for that reason. Yeah, I have worked in bureaucracy, so not not for that long, but I really enjoyed the first few chapters. I was I was laughing along and nodding along to the various <laughs> descriptions of people's behavior and, and, and also, you know, the strategy that you don't often think about explicitly uh, that, that explains why they're behaving the way that they do. Yeah. Another anecdote that, that sticks out to me is uh, he uh, did a lot to explain kind of the ideology that comes along with working in a corporation, perhaps the, the moral ho- hollowing out that, uh, that comes with working in a, in a corporation for a long time where... It's very bad for your career to think too much in moral terms and not enough about uh, expedience and what, what 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 is expedient for the company and what's going to advance your career. And there was a case where uh, two people at this firm uh, who had been having an affair uh, ac- were, were making out in the parking lot and, and everyone saw. And not a, not a single person objected to the fact that they were cheating on their partners. Uh, they just thought that this was bad because it showed that they lacked the self-control necessary to do the dirty work of the company. Uh, this, is, this is what they would say in the private, uh, in, in the private interviews with the, with the ethnographer. Uh-huh. And it was uh, somewhat struck that they just didn't think of this as a moral issue at all. It was purely a matter of pragmatism. <laughs> so uh, moving on, um, what is the path that took you to where you ended up, up now? And uh, what are some particularly good calls you think you've made as your career has progressed? What see i guess there's a question of how far back you want to go like you could go all the way back to like being an undergraduate and like going to graduate school and then like all the way up to the present so why don't i do that why don't i just start back from being uh undergrad to grad to grad school so when i was a young boy i dreamed of working in a foundation (laughs) (laughs) um right so when i was an when i was an undergrad i guess maybe one of the one of the big first choices i i i I made was um Am I going to go to graduate school in philosophy or economics, or am I going to like go and try and make a bunch of money and do like a kind of proto earning to give type strategy? I guess uh, maybe at that point in my life, this is like back in like 2006 when I was sort of making these choices. I had read Peter Singer as an undergraduate, and I had some kind of you know vague utilitarian guilt that I ought to be like doing something useful for the world. I think I ended up really just going with the thing that of those that I seemed like most likely to be exceptional at. Um, I kind of had more signs that like I would majored in philosophy and double majored in math and like I think I had some signs that I was like could possibly be, be a very good philosopher and like not really signs that I was like going to be like some like really excellent mathematician and I think I hadn't really tried as much e- economics exactly. And I think I was kind of more gripped by and interested in the like philosophy questions. So I was like sort of spending my a ton of my time like going through piles of books at the library that, um, that were in the philosophy section, and less of it in any of the other ones. So um, I think I basically and it, maybe it was so it was, it was a personal interest thing, and kind of some rough sense like back at that point I, I was most interested in epistemology, um, and I had some feeling like, geez, like. Figuring out good standards of reasoning um, in a general way and like not just in a sort of like here's how you do a particular statistical test type way seemed like a very valuable project and like the people philosophers seemed like the people who were kind of mm, the best and most natural fit for uh, for carrying out a project like that or at least the only people who seemed to be thinking about it that I had found at that point in my life. And so, anyway, so I went and I decided to go to grad school in philosophy, and I went to Rutgers. You know, basically, that was the best program I was accepted to, and it's, it's uh, you know, at the time, I think it was, like, ranked, you know, top three in, in philosophy in the U.S. So it, was, it was a good program. So, anyway, that that's an interesting question to think about, which of those was the best choice. I guess I'm glad I didn't do the proto earning to give thing. And I'm not sure how, how it would have played out if I had went and done economics instead. I think that, that's maybe it would be kind of more of a debate. So I went to grad school and uh, I was mostly thinking about epistemology. I think there are two things that, that made me end up changing and deciding, well, I, I should be studying some other things and thinking about other things in my life. And um, I guess they were, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about ethics. I was having a lot of debates about consequentialism and utilitarianism with people in grad school. I felt, felt like I wasn't really being talked out of my like broadly utilitarian view on things. 
I was feeling some kind of cognitive dissonance about my life. Um, I, I think I was like, hmm, are we really making a lot of question of progress in like a practical way on like how to reason better? Um, and I think in, in a lot of ways, the questions that seemed like most popular in philosophy uh, seemed like maybe they weren't making a lot of progress on that question either. Like um, a lot of the community seemed more interested in like the analysis of like what knowledge is, um, which didn't seem like particularly useful to me as like an input into, you know, deciding exactly how to reason. And, you know, there was, there was a community doing stuff on, uh, on like foundations of Bayesianism. And um, I think that stuff, you know, kind of heuristically was very interesting to think about and like think about how to apply, but it didn't really seem like, you know, it, it felt like a lot of the questions were difficult to get a lot of traction on and like didn't seem super actionable in terms of, you know, getting better at thinking about how to reason exactly. And then at the same time, I was sort of, I was like, I went and read this biography of Paul Farmer, um, who's a founder of Partners in Health and, you know, kind of like heroically saving all of these lives and uh, setting up an organization that does that and just kind of feeling like a bit sort of unexcited about my future. Um, so I kind of resolved at that point, like, you know, I really should be living up more to my values and I'm going to need, if I'm going to succeed at this, I'm going to need to find other people um, that are interested in thinking about this stuff. Um, so kind of at that point in my life started, um, you know, looking for that, thinking maybe I should be thinking more about ethics. Like that's kind of the incremental change in like research interest that would kind of seem like have more of a chance of being of being relevant to the world and um, thinking about what I could do in my spare time. Um, just just to, 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 to be more to be to have more of a contribution to things. Um, and it was around that period that I started getting introduced to, uh, this was in, in around 2009, uh, that I started getting introduced to like various players in kind of early days of the effective altruist community. So, um, went and read about, uh, some early plans for giving what we can starting before it was a thing, uh, was kind of introduced to early stage give well, um, through Peter Singer when I went and asked, asked him asking him for advice about what I should do with my life, just taking a class with him, you know, was introduced to like Nick Bostrom's work just kind of randomly from a colleague that uh, said, oh, you might really like this paper on infinite ethics that I found on Nick Bostrom's website. And they were indeed right. I really did like that paper. <laughs> and then I sort of was looking through a bunch of the other things, bumped in. Uh, Robin Hansen came and spoke at a class I was in. Uh, I was taking at Princeton and sort of like looking through his blog and thinking about things on there. So, um, and then I guess like next stage in my next stage here is was something like maybe I should write a dissertation on something particularly relevant. And I was thinking through at that point arguments that I'd seen from Nick Bostrom about astronomical waste. And I was like, OK, well, um, maybe I could write a dissertation about this. That seems like there's a lot of points in this argument that are debatable that maybe I could shed some light on and ended up doing that. I decided that of these communities in the proto EA land that I thought I could help um, I had the most resonance at that time with like the sort of giving what we can crowd. I had a lot of conversations with Toby Ord and Will McCaskill at that point and thought, you know, maybe I could help um, giving what we can be more effective. I got really involved with them and became a, a trustee of that organization and helped launch student groups. Uh, the, the, the first ones that were kind of like EA branded in, in the U.S. and uh, met a lot of the people that are kind of in my current network through that to try and kind of speed this up and so I don't ramble on forever. Uh, I guess next other things I did was I was writing this dissertation, went and visited the folks at FHI for a summer, got to know them uh, better. And I went and interned at GiveWell for a summer and got to know that group of people better. My first job coming out of that, I took as a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute. And, you know, after being there for almost two years, I uh, got an offer from Open Phil to come and work on um, things there, and been doing that for the last three years. While you were writing your thesis about the value of the very long run feature, yeah. you were also doing work that was focused on uh, poverty reduction specifically. Uh, was that a tension, and uh, why did it take you a while to to switch towards focusing on existential risks or c catastrophic risks? It was a little bit of a tension. I mean, I think couple reasons. So one reason was it still felt a bit crazy to me somehow um, to sort of be making 
like placing some kind of bet on my life that is sort of like, well, I'll have this like small probability of like getting this huge number, getting this getting this huge amount of um, good accomplished. And I, I was particularly thinking about stuff that just seemed, I think I hadn't vetted as thoroughly views about the plausibility of AI and space colonization and kind of crazy transformative tech type things. And it just, uh, it felt a little bit crazy, I guess, was one reason. And then the other reason was I had some hopes that like promoting the growth of the effective altruist community would eventually like help a lot with like existential risks yeah, would, would end up helping with it, especially if it turned out to be like a well-reasoned case. I, I think I think for that reason, I felt okay about about what I was doing at the time. I think in retrospect, I think the EA community was like maybe a little bit too hesitant to like wear the weird on its sleeve. And I, maybe I maybe I prefer that we had sort of like done more of that. Uh, in the past, when you've had uh, somewhat close calls uh, trying to decide what to do next with your career. You've often written up quite lengthy documents considering all of the all of the pros and cons of the yeah. different options. Do you think that was a good use of time and something that other people should do as well? I do think that was a good use of time. I think there were maybe a couple cases where I overanalyzed it a bit, um, but I think on balance that sort of the the direction to err in a methodology I found really useful with decisions like that is like step one like write down all of the considerations, pros and cons, as you see them right now, and sort of rank them in terms of importance. Step two, like, write down all of your, like, key uncertainties or, like, articulate all the ways that you're kind of uncomfortable with your current stance on the issue. Step three, like, state a, like, default action. Like, this is kind of, like, gun to my head thing I'm going to decide now. Uh, step four, like, list things you could do to investigate um, to investigate this question and resolve your uncertainties and like ways you're uncomfortable um, and do them and then like talk to a bunch of people that whose judgment you trust and know about your situation. Do a bunch of that. Maybe you do a little bit of iteration on listing of questions. I think a failure mode is where you kind of just keep thinking about it until it seems clear what the right decision is. I think in some cases that's interminable. Um, and that's kind of a mistake I, I made at, at, at some point in my life when I was sort of thinking about what the next next career step is. But I think at some point you gotta you have to just say like, all right, well, I, I investigated. I'm likely to know. I investigated all the things I should investigate. This is my choice. I, I'm making it. But I do think I, do, I really I do feel pretty good about having spent time like writing up these documents. I think the thing that was a waste is kind of more like it's like agonize over it a whole bunch, <laughs> even when I'm like not don't seem to be adding anything to the decision. I'd like to now talk about uh, three blog posts that you've written uh, over the last few years. Uh, and the first one uh, is one about in vitro meat or uh, clean meat, as it's often called now. Two years ago, you wrote that you were fairly uh, pessimistic about the rate at which uh, clean meat might be developed. And for that reason, I think Open Phil was more likely to make grants focused on plant-based alternatives to uh, animal products rather than, you know, cultured meat. What were the concerns that you had at, at that time? Well, maybe I should just say, like, a bit to contextualize, like, what I and Open Phil did to investigate this question and, like, what our current stance, you know, what our current stance is, sort of, like, how, how confident we are in that. I had one of one of my projects here at Open Phil um, has been to identify areas that uh, are particularly promising as possible program areas in science. Um, I've been working with scientific advisors to help me sort of evaluate a lot of technical material, and you know, m my role has been kind of on the value side to think uh, to think a bit about like you know how how good would it be if we accomplished this goal, and you know, and also on kind of some like philanthropy type questions. How neglected is this cause really? And like, does it look like a good fit for philanthropy? And also on like the side of cer certain questions that maybe people, maybe like a lot of scientists like wouldn't think about as naturally or like consider like sort of a normal part of their discipline. Like what is the timeline uh, on which like, you know, this type of technology might be developed and with what probability might it be developed? Which is like, in some ways the scientist is kind of most is the person who like knows the most relevant inputs to that, but maybe that's like not the que type of question they're used to like writing about, writing about, and thinking about in like papers they publish. So anyway, one of the things that we decided to look into was uh, 
was alternatives to animal products. You know, I worked with uh, somebody who was working with us as a consultant at that time, who was a scientist. And we, you know, had conversations with several of the main people who work in that field, put together information about what are the companies and what philanthropic and uh, investments had been made in the area. What are the problems that need to be solved and like what kind of work could feasibly be done to solve it? We thought a little bit about like kind of analogous cases also, like uh, biotech companies that had been trying to like make a commodity, uh, the tissue engineering industry, which is in, you know, not a perfect analogy for, for clean meat, but is, is fundamentally similar in a number of ways. And we sort of tried to pull, pull all of that together and make a judgment about, about uh, you know, how promising this is. And, you know, maybe that's like all in a couple hundred hours of work or something. So uh, definitely don't consider myself like an expert on this. It's sort of the attempt was to have some kind of basic understanding of the area. And I guess our, our stance coming out of it was, you know, it didn't seem, while, while it would be very high upside and uh, it's a pretty neglected area, we didn't see a lot of evidence that it seemed particularly tractable. Some of the scientists that we consulted were pretty skeptical of whether it was going to be feasible. You know, when we had tried to sort of put numbers to it in a kind of like lowest feasible cost analysis. We, you know, we, we, we didn't really see a way to, uh, you know, get the costs down as low as possible. We, we also had some conversations with various people in this field after, uh, after we'd come to those conclusions and after kind of at a second point later, having uh, Chris Somerville, one of our science advisors, look into the cost effectiveness, or sorry, the, the lowest cost analysis and see if this was going to be feasible and also got opinions of some other scientists. And, you know, from people who didn't really have a horse in the race, they tended to be very, very skeptical of it. And we didn't really hear from people uh, kind of what I would consider to be convincing arguments uh, or, you know, counter considerations on what the what the lowest possible cost was likely to be. So my position is not like, uh, you know, hey, that that definitely won't work. And I think some people might argue like, well, if you don't know it won't work and the upside is so high, then like you should, you know, open fill should invest in it anyway, because, you know, that's like a good way to do science funding. And I guess I don't totally see it that way. I think if you kind of do some preliminary investigation on the tractability of some idea and all the signs that you're seeing point to kind of pessimistic, you know, you could argue that, hey, we should look into it more. And like maybe at that point it would start looking more like it was going to work out. But I think like it, it doesn't seem like a funder should sort of be funding on the basis of like, well, all the signs we looked into it when we looked into tractability like looked pretty unpromising. So that's a basic stance. And uh, you could say like, well, you should go for moonshots. I mean, and I, th I guess my reply is like, well, if that's the philosophy you want to take, like what, what are the best moonshots you should be doing? And less of a stance of like, well, this is a moonshot that like sort of is good, so you should go for it. And, you know, we, we made an investment in, in Impossible Foods. Um, and, you know, I think that is sort of like a more promising bet in, in a number of ways um, than, than uh, you know, what we might have done in, in clean meat. Impossible Foods does plant-based Does plant-based alternatives, yeah. Um, that, that, that seems like a model where, you know, much more likely that the costs are going to get down in a way that, you know, it's going to be a sort of, could be a mass market enterprise that's 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 profitable so yeah i guess that, that's the basic stance uh on from my end i know like uh, a lot of people in the ea community have kind of been skeptical of this decision and i don't know that i'm right uh and uh don't have super high confidence and there's a question of what do i spend my time on i i think in an ideal world if i had sort of like a clone or something maybe that maybe the clone would would go and spend a bunch more time getting to the bottom of this debate but you know in the current world like my my focus is more on building the ea community maintaining our sort of science operation that we have going and thinking more about what we can do about global catastrophic risks. So your view might have changed in the last two years if you were still following it, but you've, your, your interests have moved on a bit. I mean, maybe, so has my view changed at all? Like, I think some people that I respect have, like, not been very convinced by Open Phil's decision, and that gives me some pause, and that that's probably, that's probably, like, the, the, the so maybe I've updated in light of that to be, like, more optimistic than I was. And so I, I'm pretty unsure whether we like made whether we've made the right call on that. Yeah, it's sort of sort of where it stands. All right, next one. 
A uh, topic that you wrote about in your thesis and then have expanded on in a PowerPoint presentation on your site, and, and I think some, some blog posts you've mentioned it, is the difference between narrow and broad interventions for trying to improve the world. Uh, do, do you want to explain what that uh, dichotomy is? Sure. So it goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Suppose you agree that you want to shape the distant future for the better. And suppose that th then, there's, then there's two kinds of of strategies. There's some kind of axis you could think of as broad versus narrow strategies for pursuing that goal, where a narrow strategy might kind of be betting on like a specific problem or a specific kind of outcome. You know, for example, I think like preparing for potential risks from AI and the, you know, is, is a sort of a lot of strategies for dealing with that would be like very kind of narrow and concrete strategies, you know, thinking about the, the thing that I proposed earlier of like having a specific plan for how society should respond to that is like very much on the narrow end of the spectrum. And then on the broad end of the spectrum, there could be things that might benefit in many types of outcomes or might be particularly, you know, responsive to like potential unknown unknowns um, that we could be responding to. And maybe a great example of that kind of thing would be like trying to have people or institutions ha make better judgments. If you if we if we if you imagined a world where kind of, you know, Tetlock had his way and all the pundits and like governments were kind of making accountable precise forecasts for everything. It, you know, th th that has the potential to af affect a lot of a lot of the quality of of decision making on various levels and could be valuable for a variety of outcomes. Um so it'd be sort of like maybe a paradigmatic case of like a broad and a broad type of intervention. So the difference being that some approaches are very useful in one scenario and others are kind of useful in many scenarios. Yeah, pretty much. Um, other examples of like broad interventions, like maybe you believe that if society has like a faster overall rate of economic growth, then, um, you know, there's a, a variety of good things you could hope for happening as a result of that. You know, if we have our scientific institutions function better, if like information is more freely available, um, these would all kind of be in the broad category. Preparing for like specific global catastrophic risks, all very much in the narrow category. So it seems over time you've shifted from working on broader to more narrow interventions. Uh, what's what's the reason for that? Well, let's see. I'm, I mean, it's not it's not totally clear that I've I've switched so much in terms of like where 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 my attention is. I mean, kind of like. I guess I, well, hmm. writing a dissertation about like the, the, the sort of importance of shaping the far future is kind of, I guess it's a little bit of both, but maybe more on the sort of uh, targeted end of the spectrum. And like working at FHI was sort of more like the, the targeted end of the spectrum. And uh, promoting EA is kind of like, I don't know, it's like somewhere in between um, insofar as, you know, EA might might do some of each. But it's true that I've had kind of a shift in my thinking over time about, uh, you know, becoming more and more in favor of the sort of targeted end of the spectrum. Why is that exactly? I think uh, over time, I've just kind of I've held some of these views for longer and been in more arguments about them and feel like pieces of it uh, haven't ha have kind of like held up maybe better than my than I might have expected at some points in the past. I think I have like more of an understanding of some of the central issues related to like a AI and I've seen a like a kind of more of a debate play out on that and you know I think there was a time when I was kind of waiting for like a secret argument that like people more knowledgeable than me had that they kind of weren't saying or I wasn't hearing publicly and um I think I largely sort of haven't haven't heard the secret argument that uh, that AI is not really as important as it seems, and kind of like my inside view model of the situation, and sort of uh, so I, I think I think that's really been the main the main piece of it in terms of arguments that were kind of already on my mind. A lot of the sort of like broad type stuff is just kind of more popular in society and like less neglected for that reason. Um, there's a lot of people who, you know, in some way or another are interested in seeing, um, you know, faster economic growth. You know, everybody who's like has a relevant company that they want to see succeed is doing that. It's just kind of a much more popular lens in public policy making. although, you know, I would like it to be a more popular one. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I guess I guess that's that, that, that's a that's a bit of the of the summary of it. So the broad interventions seem less neglected and the narrow interventions perhaps seem, seem more tractable than, uh, than you thought 10 years ago or five years ago. 
Yeah, I think there is some kind of there's some kind of framework like that says, you know, you should be making this decision on the basis of, you know, these tractability considerations, uh, these neglectedness considerations. And, you know, the more you have like high confidence in a particular inside view understanding of a situation, the more sense it makes to bet on the narrow side. So somebody whose view of the world is like, it's all unknown unknowns in the future. We can't really like plan for stuff that like might happen more than like five or 10 years from now on the basis of like technologies that don't currently exist. You know, I think someone who views the world more that way um, should go more on the broad side. Someone who views the world more in, in a way that's like, well, I don't really know for sure, but like, I think there's some possibilities that can be like reasonably anticipated and prepared for in a way that is effective. I think, you know, there's more to be said on the sort of narrow end of the spectrum. Hmm. And so I guess as I've like seen debates play out and learned more about things, um, I've kind of, you know, come down harder on the side of, you know, we can reasonably anticipate and prepare for some of these outcomes. Hmm. I'm pretty firmly on the on the narrow end of things uh, mm -hmm. in terms of my, my preferences for what problems to work on. And one of the reasons is that uh, tools that you create that help to improve economic growth or just general human productivity uh, not only help people who are doing good things, but also help people who are either deliberately or unintentionally doing things that are harmful. And I think the fraction of human activity that is unintentionally harmful is actually quite large, uh, potentially, possibly even even a majority. What what do you make of that argument? I guess there's a lot that could be said here, but I just wanted to wanted to flag that issue that uh, just just speeding everything up isn't so good if, on average, things are not great. So. A number of things to say about that. I think there's like a reasonable debate to be had here. I think some people kind of might have a knee-jerk reaction of like, oh, it's definitely good to like speed up the progress of society. And maybe some people might have like a knee-jerk reaction. It's like, it's definitely bad. I think there's kind of reasonable cases that you could make on both sides of the issue. I think, you know, th th so th thoughts to offer on this, I think like an obligatory first thought would be, well, it seems like Putting aside like factory farming, which is a big thing to put aside, um, I think uh, there's a there's a very strong case to make, and Steven Pinker's made it that, and other people have made it, and I think it's a lot of common sense in a way that I'd much rather be alive today than like 200 years ago, and um, the thing that has changed is like largely progress in science and technology, and uh, you know we live in a different world, I think more than anything else because of that, th those things at this point. I think there's like a kind of like, well, so far it's been good argument. You know, from my perspective as a sort of like long-term future type person, the main question is like, how does this all, if it goes faster or slower, how does that really affect where we end up in the very long run? And, you know, that's not a question that can be answered by historical experience. That's like inherently a speculative question. And I guess, uh, you know, the way the way that I would want to analyze that would be, you know, I think there's like some, some kind of inside viewish ways you could analyze it and some kind of like rougher and more heuristic ways that, that you could analyze it. So I think that um, when society has like a faster rate of economic growth, it tends to be more peaceful and more inclined to, uh, you know, allow for social progress, especially when it involves like some people making sacrifices in terms of like their status or uh, future prospects in order to make things more fair for others. I think uh, there's a nice book by uh, Benjamin Friedman, I believe, called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth that, that sort of makes the case for parts of this view. And I'm, I'm fairly sympathetic to it, although, you know, I, I don't feel like I, I'm in a position to vet it all super deeply because it, it's very broad ranging and, and kind of difficult. So so those are some of the thoughts on that. Yeah, so overall I think it probably I think it probably is good for, for where society ends up. Um, if we if we have a faster rate of growth. Oh, those are the those are the heuristic considerations. There's also some kind of specific considerations. I I, I have a bit of a kind of optimistic view about what happens, which is very it's a very debatable view, but uh, uh, it's a view I hold about what happens if you know, society succeeds in in developing like very powerful AI systems. And I think it would, you know, solve a lot of the other potential risks to society's future. So I think, you know, in some ways, if that happens sooner, uh, there's an argument that 
there's an argument that like it's going to protect us from a number of other risks that that we're going to face. I think there's arguments on both sides of this. You know, you know, I think it's 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 less clear, especially if you think um, you know you might have AI in the next couple of decades, which is not my main guess, but it's a possibility that I think is important to consider. Maybe we're going to be less prepared if if these things happen sooner. You know, I, I guess I'm inclined to say that the considerations on the other side of that ledger um, are more important. And I think you know, yeah, people could disagree about about which side wins out. Yeah, just just to be clear, um, I, I definitely agree with you and Pinker, and I guess all of the new optimist uh, folks that uh, the state of the world, in a sense, has gotten better over the last few hundred years. That uh, the welfare of people is better of non-human animals. It's a bit a bit less clear. It might might well be worse. But again, setting that aside, the thing that's gotten worse, it seems to me, is that how the future is, or how the next year is going to be, has become more and more variable that in the past we were in a bad state, but a relatively stable state. Today, the, the risk of a disaster that could throw us completely off track is uh, really qu- is quite high in my view, uh, possibly you know, at a peak. Uh, it's, it's, it's as high as it's been since maybe the Cuban Missile Crisis or, or things like that. that. Like There was just no way really to drive humans to extinction in 1800s, whereas now there's just uh, so many obvious ways that civilization could, could really be uh, totally ruined, even if not everyone is killed. So in that sense, very important sense, the world has gotten worse. And it's a bit less clear whether would be in a better or worse situation there if the process of development had happened more quickly or more slowly. And I guess you were laying out the considerations on either side there. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, the right framing. The, the one way you could think about it is like you could sort of if you if you think if you think of it like there's some kind of states of progress that society like has to go through in order to like reach some kind of desirable end state. You know, there'll be some of these risks that you just kind of inherently go through whenever you, like, reach a certain level of progress. And there'll be some kinds of risks that you're sort of accruing year by year the longer you're in one of these states. So, for example, you know, there's some kind of clock that maybe starts ticking once you have nuclear weapons or you have, like, enough nuclear weapons to to have, like, a devastating nuclear war. Um, and maybe every year you're in that state, you're kind of you're you're kind of you're suffering some risk of of a, of a war happening and and something terrible happening to society. Or maybe uh, at some point in the future, we'll get into a state where we have uh, very very powerful bioweapons that a lot of people could deploy if they wanted to. And maybe every year we're in that state without a sort of solution to it. We're accruing we're accruing some risk. I think that there is a state where if we kind of get to it eventually that you know our annual like risk on the clock is sort of is sort of low so there's some kind of prima facie argument that like if you're kind of going through this thing more quickly then in one way you'll be better off you'll be better off for these sort of risks that you're accruing every every year um i think the kind of countervailing consideration to that uh is these sort of step risks that are triggered when you like reach certain points on this trajectory you know if you're going through it at a faster rate there's questions about how that affects those risks. So maybe there's certain things that are kind of like how prepared society is for the for the risk, which varies somewhat independently of the state of progress that we're in. Maybe if we're kind of you know going more slowly through the states of progress, then we kind of um, you know have more time to adjust and get accustomed to the states that we're in, or we can see something coming further further along and like prepare for it and have more time to prepare for it. So I think that's one kind of consideration. You know, and then there's other considerations like ones I already mentioned on the other side. Like maybe if we're kind of in a state of greater prosperity, maybe people are kind of have a less of a zero sum mentality and are kind of more willing to sort of like compromise and feel good about what's happening, less likely to be in wars and stuff like that. So those are how I sort of see the the sides of that coin. My my guess is that we're, we're better off with the sort of state of prosperity, which corresponds to like moving through the stages of progress more quickly. We started out talking about broad interventions and then ended up talking a bit specifically about economic growth rates. Yeah. That's interesting that one broad intervention that I think we would both think is fairly reliably good is moral improvement. Try Because while scientific technology or economic improvement can be kind of misused or have negative uh, side effects, it's a bit harder to see how people having good moral values and concern for others uh, could result in, in negative outcomes. It might turn out not to be that valuable, but it seems like it's either neutral or good. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm not sure that, like, I think this could also be said of some of the other things, like sort of 
greater wisdom or ability to like mm-hmm. make predictions or like have a more functional bureaucracies yeah. or some, things like that. Um, the, the, the improvements in forecasting are kind of similar. I guess I guess it's possible to see how that could be used in an adversarial way. Yeah, but, uh, but it seems more like um, you know most countries would be happy if uh, other countries also had good foresight into <laughs> the effects of their actions. Right. Perhaps it's worth discussing a little bit, like. Tyler Cowen's writing on on this topic, like in, in his uh, recent book online, Stubborn mm-hmm. Attachments, which yeah. is sort of overlapping themes with like many things we've discussed on here today in terms of making a lot of claims that I have like a lot of interest yeah. in and sympathy with. Like, you know, I, I, I think we would kind of agree on like what's been so great for humans over time has been, you know, tied up in a big way with economic growth and sort of if you were kind of counting the score so far, you know, you'd be really excited about things that enhance that that rate of economic growth. He kind of has very, you know, very similar views about the role of economic discounting and presents a similar view in terms of saying, well, on many possible ways of doing aggregation of good across people, the way that you calculate the long-term consequences of actions that sort of benefit the distant future will dwarf the sort of short-term consequences. I guess where I end up, he, he, he kind of frames his bottom line view about like what's important as like maximize the sustainable rate of economic growth. I, I guess I, I would have a couple of differences of opinion with, with, with that as framed. One, I tend to take a view of like sort of the structure of possible progress as looking more like an S curve than the kind of exponential that like has been experienced by humanity so far. So you mean it goes up and then it levels off? Yes. And I think on that view, that that the consequence of having a faster rate of economic growth is is not that we're gonna be in a much better state twenty million years from now if we've had a if if we've had a faster rate of economic growth. Instead it's more like uh, we're going to get to that really nice state we could be in sooner. You know, my view, and I think you know, Bostrom kind of explains this pretty well in uh, in in some of his papers on astronomical waste, and I argue for it in my in my in my dissertation. My view is is that uh, it's much more important where we end up than how quickly we get there. And uh, you know, how quickly we get there is mostly going to matter in terms of the considerations that we were discussing earlier. Like, you know, what is that really, how much does that affect the probability that we actually eventually end up in a great place mm. or not? Anyway, that, that's kind of an interesting foil for a lot of this conversation, his, yeah. his views on this. So that, 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 I guess that would be one of my disagreements. And then the other one, he might in some ways be have a similar view to me if like sustainable were interpreted very broadly. Like, you know, uh, so I mean, for me, the, the, the use of the word sustainable isn't like exactly focused on like environmentalist concerns, although that's like part of the picture. And it's like more about are we going to manage to not destroy ourselves mm. uh, and sort of manage all the kind of important technological transitions ahead of us well? Yeah. I'll put up a link to that book by Tyler Cohen and a one-hour podcast uh, where he explains his views uh, in brief. I think over the last 10 years, I've literally read something by Tyler Cohen every day, or at least on average once a day. So I'm quite familiar with with uh, Tyler's views by this point. And I find it's it's such an unusual book. It's such an uncanny experience reading it because I find that he and I agree on all kinds of weird things where almost no one uh, agrees with with me. And I guess totally with you agree. As well. Totally and, agree. And then <laughs> there's this twist where he arrives at a completely different conclusion where that seems uh, quite obviously wrongheaded to me. And then I just I'm not sure what to make of it. I think it, maybe it would it would be quite uh, interesting uh, to have him on a show where both of us could interrogate him and get try or try, or try to understand where why he's gone off on a different track kind of at the last at the last second yeah it would be interesting to to do it i imagine that his central disagreement might be this broad versus targeted thing i think he might think we're sort of not going to get any traction on this speculation about like what kind of specific risks we're preparing for Mm -hmm. and would have a view more like we'll we'll try to have functional institutions in our society and that's going to be the best hope we can have for affecting where things end up and I don't know what he would say about the argument about, you know, the S-curve versus the other mm-hmm. thing and, and what that implies. It seems like a an odd thing to neglect because it's just that seems like the obvious response and it's a response that was made decades ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll send Tyler an email with maybe some of these uh, some of these ideas and see if we can get him on the on the show. 
So uh, I was going to mention and discuss a, a third blog post uh, that you wrote uh, where you tried to analyze quantitatively uh, whether we want faster technological progress or slower, but we've kind of already covered that. But there's a tool on that post that I'll, that I'll link to which allows you to uh, stick in your own estimates for, for a couple of uh, different parameters that are relevant to it and then uh, kind of get your own decision from this, from this calculator as to whether you think faster or slower economic growth is, is better for the world. Mm-hmm. Now, before we move on to the section on uh, concrete career advice, I just wanted to see if there was any other kind of scientific research areas like uh, malaria eradication or meat alternative uh, research that uh, you wanted to, to talk about in more detail. I think biosecurity, um, you know, people, there, there's a lot of, there's a great role for people in the effective altruist community to get to get involved with that. I think, although I'm, I'm, I'm less optimistic about clean meat or cultured meat, you know, I am really optimistic about about plant-based meat alternatives and I don't think I know everything about about cultured meat so you if you know if you disagree with that with my analysis you know might 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 be a plausible area to bet on mm. what about malaria eradication I think the open philanthropy project made a pretty significant grant to a group that's doing research into whether it would be possible to change mosquitoes in such a way that they would no longer carry malaria. Is that something you're you're excited about? And how do you think it might compare to the cost effectiveness of distributing bed nets? It's really hard to estimate, you know, what the cost effectiveness of it, of that is compared to distributing bed nets. My, you know, we did we did a calculation on our grant page on target malaria. You know, it suggests that the you know the cost per life saved is going to be is going to be um, more favorable for uh, working on gene drives specifically than um, distributing bed nets. And you know, I le- I know less about exactly where people could fit into that operation, but I think that would be for somebody who feels like they they have like more of a responsibility to uh, kind of the people that are alive today and really unfortunate and suffering from things like malaria. I think that would be like, we're getting involved with that problem would be a really good bet. And uh, it would also be a, a kind of a compelling idea for somebody who's sort of like skeptical of just this whole conversation being like sort of a bit out there. I think, which, I think they might have, they might have stopped listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, I think, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of work to be done in terms of being convincing to the both both from a policy side and from a, a scientific side to you know bring the technology to fruition, test it, and confirm that it is going to be safe. Figuring out what the regulatory pathway is going to be, I do think you know that one that one. There's a question of how long that's going to take, and so if somebody was like just starting their undergraduate degree right now or something, it might be sort of like too late for you to contribute to that. I um, mean, the problem might be gone by the time you uh, have studied long enough to yeah, contribute. Yeah. So with the last half an hour of the episode, uh, we usually like to try to get as concrete as we can for listeners uh, thinking about specific things that they could potentially do now in order to have a larger impact with their, with their career. So we're thinking, you know, jobs they could apply for or PhDs that they could study or, you know, what they should major in as an undergrad or where they should volunteer and how they can make connections. And in your case, Nick, we, we could talk both about uh, how they could potentially do work that's similar to you doing global priorities research and making making grants on the basis of that. And also just uh, based on your experience trying to make grants, where would you love to see more people who could uh, take grants and, and uh, use the money from Open Field? To, to do really good things. So maybe let's take them in order. If someone wanted to work at OpenPhil or a similar organization, uh, what should they be doing when they're you know, an undergrad or what should, they, what should they do a postgrad on? So if somebody wanted to work at OpenPhil, I think there's not a very obvious degree for them to be studying. I think, you know, I think it's more like we're looking for people who are very interested in what OpenPhil is doing, have good judgment and calibration, are generally sharp. So I would encourage people who are interested in that to, um, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the people who now work at OpenPhil as, as kind of generalist types rather than sort of specialist program officers, they've come through, um, you know, working at GiveWell or working with GiveWell or OpenPhil on a, on an internship. So I think I would encourage those people to, you know, just apply for one of those internships while, you know, maybe their junior year uh, of college and you know see how it goes and see if they they're a fit for the for the culture and in terms of what they study i think it i think it's not super important um i think they should just study you know a serious discipline that you know they that they're particularly interested in okay. uh is it worth doing postgraduate study before you apply to the open philanthropy project or would you take the right person straight out of undergrad we would take the right person straight out okay interesting 
Uh, if someone's not quite yet ready to apply for an internship, is there any way that they can meet the folks at Open Philanthropy Project in any kind of conference or socially? I mean, often like folks at Open Phil will sh will go to things like EA Global, at least some of them. So there's some opportunity to meet them there. If you weren't ready for one of these internships, maybe it didn't work out, but you still wanted to to go and work at Open Phil, I guess maybe your options would be like stick around the EA community and try to like make some valuable contributions and show that you have good judgment. And, you know, I think over time, I think it's possible, you, you know, open field might look back and be like, wow, that person actually has done some really useful things. Maybe we should reconsider that. Or maybe our needs have changed. You know, we're maybe we become a larger organization. We need to hire the person um, later at, at a later stage. Um, the other option would be like, try to, would be to like go and get some skills that might make you, uh, you know, a, a valuable asset um, in as a specialist in one of the areas that we're particularly interested in. Maybe if you got uh, you know a deep background in, in biosecurity, maybe there would be a role for you in the future uh, on our team working on biosecurity. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Yeah. First, I wanted to ask, uh, what are the, like, I mean, the Open Philanthropy Project is only about 10 or 15 people, so it's quite a small organization to, to plan your it's career. It's in the 20s in, now. It's in but, the 20s now, it's yeah, larger. But still, your point stands. Yeah, it's still quite a small organization to plan your career around. What are some other similar foundations or organizations where someone who was a good fit for you would also be a good fit for them? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a saying about foundations that is like, if you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's basically true in the sense that it's sort of hard to generalize across them. I think the thing that would maybe work at other organizations in the EA community um, would be the sort of like natural ecosystem to, if you were interested in this work and kind of wanted to gain experience with it and would be the, the natural place to consider. Okay, let's talk now about the the second option you're considering, which is uh, what can people do in um, Open Phil's kind of priority problem areas? What kinds of uh, young people are you most excited to to find out about? Uh, you know, what are they studying and what are they planning to do with their careers, and what what what, what path are they uh, going to take to get there? Right. If you can feel, you can feel free to basically uh, describe as many kind of archetypes as you like of people who you're really excited to discover. Somebody who's really interested in deep learning, very quantitatively oriented, cares about AI safety, and you know is just kind of generally crushing it uh, in their study of that. I think that's that's an archetype that's really useful. I'd encourage that person to apply for uh, the Google Brain residency program as a way of um, learning more about deep learning and getting into the field. I think it could go more quickly than going through a PhD and is a quick way into industry. I think otherwise applying for a PhD program um, in computer science focused on ML would, would be would be a great natural path. Working with one of the labs that Open Phil funds to do work on AI safety might be a, might be a natural thing to do also. They could you know potentially start working on AI safety issues uh, right away and ha specialize in that in their career and that, that, that could be really valuable. Yeah, that's my answer for technical AI safety and, and that particular archetype. The other category we mentioned was sort of AI strategy work. And I don't think there's a supernatural field specific archetype there. I think the person who does that doesn't need to be quantitatively oriented. They need to be very sharp and they need to have good judgment and they need to like be interested in thinking about how institutions and politics work. And I think the the thing to do would be to, you know, take a stab at some of the some of the questions that have been highlighted on the 80,000 hours post describing this area and to seek out conversations with people in the area, especially Luke Melhauser, who is, uh, you know, focusing on trying to to find the right people to work in the space. In biosecurity, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the, 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 the right programs to apply to are, but um, I think there's two paths, one of which is kind of more like policy and one of which is more like uh, learning the science. Um, Getting a PhD in, in, in some area of biology, perhaps focused on immunology um, or vaccine R&D uh, would be would be a, a natural place to go or getting a PhD or doing a fellowship at like one of the one of the places that do work on um, biosecurity, perhaps the Center for Health Security that open fill funds. Another category would be, you know, jobs in the effective altruism community. I guess we already mentioned that. And I don't think there's a supernatural background for that other than majoring in a, in a, in a serious discipline and studying it seriously, doing well, and thinking about the kinds of issues that the effective altruist community cares about and getting to know it uh, and de debate it in person, I think would be would be my advice for that category. I would love to see more people um, getting jobs in the US government that could be relevant to AI and to other cause areas. 
I don't know what the most relevant parts of government are to work for. Um, the sort of archetype of success, I think, is the career of Jason Matheny. So if you kind of like tried to reverse engineer that, you know, that would be kind of on, on the right track. But I think somebody somebody needs to think through in a more detailed way how to do that. Mm. Jason uh, said that he's happy to come on the show. So as soon as we can find a time, uh, then, then we'll have a podcast with him. And so people can people can set about reverse engineering his life. <laughs> what about people who are interested in animal welfare? So I think animal welfare is like super important. And if somebody wanted to make a difference in that area, I think my top tips might be if you're kind of more of a STEMI type person, then I would advise you to get a background in biology and try to find a place that you can work in the sort of animal product alternative space. And if you are, you know, not exactly a STEMI type person, then um, you might be interested in advocacy. Then I would advise you to, uh, you know, learn more about that space and consider working for some of the grantees that open fill funds or, you know, ask Lewis Bollard what to do. <laughs> I have a three-hour-long episode with Lewis Bollard, so there's uh, plenty of suggestions in there uh, for people who are interested in that. In fact, we have episodes on basically all of the uh, topics that, that we've just discussed there. So, Great. Uh, you know, you've talked about these things for a few minutes, but in, in most of these cases, we have, like, hour-long discussions where, where all of the options are fleshed out a bunch more. Great. Are there any other uh, options that you wanted to highlight? I think, you know, those could be valuable, too. I think they're, like, less close to my experience and knowledge mm -hmm. so in some ways i might might be more excited about a lot of these a lot of the other ones i listed but i'm not very firm on that your, your job seems pretty attractive but like every job has its negatives uh what's the uh worst thing about uh, the, the path that you've taken in your career my job used to be more focused on kind of individual research projects that I would spend a lot of time on and kind of bring from start to finish and there's something kind of satisfying and intellectually very interesting about that also, like, I don't know if you're kind of like looking at like the history of home runs that like we've had as a species or something. I think more of them are coming from somebody who's kind of like out in the trenches and like coming up with a new idea or creating a new organization. And it's like less like a uh, behind the scenes funder type person who's making a lot of good things happen. Although there are big wins in the history of philanthropy. Yeah. And, you know, they kind of they kind of like have a slice. People get a slice of a lot of those other wins. And so maybe there's something to be said for that would be like maybe that, that'd be kind of like the biggest like question or uncertainty that I that I have about like whether I'm doing the best thing. Yeah, Open Phil did a report on the history of philanthropy, right? And it what found that there were some successes, but maybe not as much as you might hope. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some successes and they're important successes. Um, like there are other people who like put together like compendium lists of like big achievements of humanity in commerce or politics or science and or things like that. And uh, when I read through those, the sort of like role of, of philanthropists seems to be fairly limited. Yeah, it's inter interesting phenomenon. Um, well, this has been a super fun discussion. We've covered lots of things that are of personal uh, in interest to us. I think uh, someone who's still with us uh, this far into the podcast is, uh, should probably think about whether they could <laughs> themselves work at Open Phil. They probably have a lot of uh, overlapping interests. Hopefully, we, we can really get uh, Tyler Cowan on the, on, the, on the show sometime and, uh, and see if we can uh, figure out what, what's going on with the disagreement that, that we three have. That sounds fun. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I look forward to, to doing another episode with you in the future. Yeah, it was fun. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, my guest today has been Nick Beckstead. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, consider sharing it with your friends on social media so they can find out about the show. If you want to work on any of the approaches that Nick described as high priorities, including tackling global catastrophic risks, growing the effective altruism movement, or meat substitute research, then you should apply for free one-on-one -on -one coaching from 80,000 hours. There's a link to the application process in the show notes and the associated blog post, where you will also find a full transcript and links to learn more. The application only takes a few minutes, so seriously do think about doing it. Thanks so much. Talk to you next week.